Welcome to Below the Line, where we talk about working in Hollywood from the crew perspective. My name is Skid. I was an assistant director in Hollywood for the better part of eight years, and now I'm not. Today, we're pausing our prop series to talk again about the impact of COVID-19 on the entertainment industry. And I'm hosting today with a heavy heart. Just last week, the Directors Guild lost one of their own. On April 1st, Barry Lerner passed away from COVID-19 complications. He checked in the hospital and was placed on a ventilator, but unfortunately, he never got better. He survived by his wife, Lynn. Larry's film career spanned more than 35 years, and for the last 15, he worked primarily as a first assistant director on one-hour episodic television shows, streaming series, movies of the week, feature films, and commercials. He was also active within the Guild, serving on a number of working committees and a member of the Academy of Television Art and Sciences. Why did not personally cross paths with Larry during my film industry years? All of my guests today have stories to share. First, Guy Norman B., you've been a director for almost 20 years, specializing in one-hour dramas. Welcome to Below the Line. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Robert. Next, Pamela Monroe. You've been with the Guild since 2002. You're a graduate of the DGA training program, and you're currently working as a unit production manager. Nice to see you again. Good to see you. Dan Latham, you've been working in the industry since 1995. You're currently working as an assistant director, and you're based in Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And our last chair, Bruce Humphrey. Bruce, you're also a graduate of the DGA training program and currently working in episodic television as a first AD. Welcome. Thank you very much. All right, folks, let's start by everybody sharing the stories of how they met Larry. Dan, why don't you lead us off? I was in uh, San Diego. Um, that's where I got started uh, working for Stu Siegel. And there was a feature that came to town and it was called Top Dog, it was a Chuck Norris feature. And I was at the time a key set PA. And, um, I applied for the job and I got a call from, from Larry having me come in to, to uh, interview for the position. He hired me. I was excited about that because it was my first feature and it was a Chuck Norris feature. And at the time, those were like, ah, you know, those are the good ones to have. And uh, a guy named Leo Sisman, he was the first AD on that. And, and I knew, uh, you know, my, the job I had before that was a, a set PA on a show called Renegade. So I, that was my first PA job was Renegade. So Top Dog was my second, and I basically didn't know what I was doing. And Larry was great about holding my hand and, and explaining to me what was going on and, and, and helping me through the process of learning. I, I learned so much off that guy. I just, I just can't even tell you how much I learned off him. And, and watching him do what he did and, and uh, you know, making sure that everything was there and, and leading people around and, and, and helping them to understand. I mean, he, he literally, for the people who didn't know, he taught you. And for the people who did know, he expected you to help them to do their job. He, he was amazing. It's absolutely amazing. I want to talk more about how Larry ran his sets, but let's um, share some more uh, introduction stories. Guy, you also met him on set, if that's correct. Yeah, it was a uh, 2002 uh, series called Fast Lane. Uh, a very uh, busy, a lot of moving parts kind of show. Um, Larry was the key second. Um, and also a show like that had second and third units and insert units. And, and um, you really needed Larry's uh, skills. And, and he had them, in, in, you know, as good as anybody I've ever worked with. And, uh, you know, just through the course of the, I think I directed two episodes over the course of that. I think only one of the season. Uh, we got to be friends. We uh, realized we had a few things in common that uh, that kind of kept us friendly afterwards. And we stayed in touch and hung out. And, you know, I hired him for little things after that if I could get him. Um, he wasn't always available. And I also don't shoot in LA a lot that much anymore. Yeah, so so about 18 years ago, uh, 2002. And Pamela, what's your story for when you met Larry? I met Larry in 2004. It was my last show as a DGA trainee. So I was in the DGA trainee program. And back then it lasted about a little less than two years, like a year and a, eight months or something like that, a year and seven months. So I had gone through and you know knew, I'd say as much as a very good experienced key set PA, I think it's comparable. Larry was the key second AD. Again, um, he used to, you know, gaff any second unit stuff. I just remember Larry as standing out um, definitely among the crowd. Leo was also the first AD. I feel like I should have called Leo to, to do this too. <laughs> I didn't realize they had worked together so long. 
but we've stayed friendly, both Leo and Larry and I. He he struck me as kind, and he had the sweetest eyes, and he was always smiling. And um, if anyone's ever been on a film set, you know that um, those are the times that try men's souls and women's. Um, they, you know, things get really stressful, and people get um, really serious. Um, sometimes they snap, sometimes they, you know, yell, sometimes they uh, break down. Um, but Larry didn't do any of that. I think through all the time I've known him, he was always smiling. He was always kind. He was always nice. He was like the calming effort in the room that got everyone to, you know, listen. I, I just, I can't, I just, rem you know, he was always that voice and that sweet smile and he would like you know put his arm around you and say you know it's okay it's you know it was just very not like any other ad if you're in the training program you kind of get beat up a little bit <laughs> um and i just i just uh i think he was just one in a million i want to hear some more stories about larry on set before we do bruce you're a working first ad but you hadn't actually worked with larry tell us about how you guys met I think I met Larry, and I can't put an exact date on it, but at uh, a variety of uh, DGA events, council meetings, and Larry was also involved with the, uh, the visual effects and technology committees and things like that. So sometimes he would be one of the people presenting information or demonstrating uh, apps or something like that. And I just, uh, I found that I was, was running into him a lot at, at the Guild, and he and I were also uh, both members of the Television Academy. So during the four-year consideration uh, events that they would have in any normal year, uh, we would run into each other at the Television Academy or wherever these events were held and uh, became friends from that. Uh, there is a group of ADs uh, that Larry and I were involved with as well who would get together at a local coffee shop called uh, Republic of Pi every Tuesday and uh, would just gather for the, uh, the coffee and the camaraderie and uh, chatting with fellow ADs. And, and sometimes there was uh, networking or, or, you know, industry stuff uh, thrown around as far as our discussions go. But I really came to know Larry on a friendship level from, as I say, DGA events and the Republic of Pi. Well, I appreciate all of you coming today to, to share your stories. Let's talk some more about Larry's demeanor on set. You guys all mentioned that he was kind um, and a pleasure to, to work with. Tell me some more specific stories about, about uh, working with him over the years. Oh, boy. Uh, I, you know, I just always remember being, I said something in, in like when uh, I wrote about, you know, right after I heard about the facet that, you know, to have him by my side was such a calming effect for, you know, like Pamela said, it's a, it's a three ring circus. And a lot of times uh, not everybody is in a great mood, but that, that was a Larry, you know, um, he'd have his gold fold in his hand and uh, you know, you knew you were in good hands. Um, and I, you, I, you can't always say that about, um, uh, you know, when you're in the heat of battle. So, I mean, that, that's the best thing I can say, you know, he was a filmmaker, so he didn't really, as well as, as great as he was, scheduling and as well as he did with all that you know the the nuts and bolts of what a, a, a classic first AD job is you know he, he also understood why we were doing something and then and, and there was never a, a question of like uh well you know we're gonna go to lunch or you know some sort of the typical things that you uh you get throughout the course of the day he understood he, he knew um the process as good as anybody and like I said just a common presence for a director because you know there's that there's uh, you know throughout the course of the day there's a thousand things that can go wrong and to know that you're uh you know the, the guy by your your side is um on it it's a feeling i mean it's one of the things you can check off your mental checklist throughout the day so i always have positive vibes of, you know uh, the days working with him as a first and of course as a second too because he would just kind of pop in every once in a while to the set so he wasn't there 100 percent of the time but the time he was there you know again we became friends over a couple personal things and stay and remain friends and uh we, you know, we'd speak on the phone about once a month and just just catch up in fact i never bruce i'd never met you but i he spoke highly of you kept inviting me to republic of pie <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, and I and I uh, you know lament the fact that it never really uh, has worked out. But maybe maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> You'd be welcome. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm smiling because you said he had his gold fold and for, and I know this is radio, which will mean nothing, but the damn thing was this thick. For our radio audience, Dan is spreading his fingers about six inches apart as far as all the <laughs> documents he was trying to carry. <laughs> he had full, because if there was a piece of paper that you needed for on that show, it was in his gold fold and it was, I mean, he, he literally, I remember the mornings he'd, You'd have to be cramming the stuff in. And he'd fold the one over and he'd get up and he'd push down the other just to make it try to get it flat. But it was you know, like this, that thick. And, and he had everything, everything he, you know, shot list, cast list, crew list, everything, everything that he needed yeah, was in that fold. gold fold. Yeah, and a gold fold is kind of a classic uh, old school first AD uh, in this day and age of, of laptops and iPads. It's a, basically a, a, a thick piece of leather that folds over. Um, like a trifold with a cla- you know a metal clasp and you and a and a thing that you were able to slide all your your um you know your everything you would need for the day one liner that you of course your call sheet and any notes and then you would fold it all back up and shove it into your back pocket your you know your right hip pocket and um you know the the, the good first ads I mean, it, it was like a, a serious piece of leather but you'd go through you know a few of them over the course of your career. <laughs> Larry went through, but I'm sure he, he got his money's worth out of everyone that he had to purchase over the years. Um, I can say, you know, as the only female involved in this, we didn't work together too much over the, you know, over the years, but I was um, a DGA council member, um, still am, and he would come to every meeting. I would see him once a month. Um, I went to Republic of Pi a couple of times, and before Republic of Pi, we used to meet at a Starbucks. So we moved up in the world. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I remember that particular show, there was always a couple of, um, you know, crew guys um, ogling the the pretty background girls or the, you know, flirting with me when I'm trying to get information for tomorrow's call sheet for Larry and stuff. And um, (laughs) he, this particular day, something was happening like that. And, um, we weren't getting the information out of the two best boys because they were having their fun. And uh, we, as we're walking away, I was walking away and to Larry, he whispers over to me, Pamela, I'm going to tell you this, never date below camera. <laughs> 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 it's just not worth it. <laughs> and I always remember that. <laughs> I didn't uh, work with Larry. I, I sensed that as first ADs, we had a lot in common. Uh, we would share stories about how our shows were going or on set. And uh, you're talking about the gold fold. Uh, I know I carried that big wad of paper in my pocket as well. And, and we just shared a lot of uh, the same techniques and, and, and common experiences on set. I appreciate that, Bruce. Uh, Dan, also tell me a little more. You guys did a bunch of shows together and both of your careers evolved sort of in parallel. Is that fair to say? Yeah, like I say, I've I've known him since 94 and and we we talked almost every week. I mean, especially past 10, 15 years, we talked every Sunday. Um, We would talk about the business or we just just called just to visit to see how the other one's doing. Um, um, And then, you know, when when he'd come to Atlanta, him and I'd get together and, and, uh, either if, if I was available, he'd try to get me on the show. If, if I wasn't available, we'd get together either way. But we always, we always, always say, you know, he came over and had uh, uh, dinner at my house um, last time he was here. And, and I did a couple days, second units on the, sh- on the set that he was working on. And, and it, it was, it was, he was fun. I mean, I, that's, I mean, um, Skid, you and I were talking the other day about, you know, if, if I get started on stories, I can tell you stories, just fun stories about the guy, you know, I mean, things that, 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 that uh, he, I mean, a lot of people don't know, he was in a band, and I don't know if a lot of people knew that, and he was telling me a story about, he, he was in San Francisco, and, and there was a, a guitar player sitting on the side of the sidewalk, um, had his little box out, and he was guy playing guitar, and people were throwing him money, and it, was, it turned out to be it was Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> He, I, I have a lot of stories. He had more stories. He had stories about about music. I mean, he 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 knew the guys. He knew the guys intimately from you know Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. He was a guitar player. Um, you know, 
I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little lost for words right now because there's so many things going through my head because we're sitting here talking about Larry and I got, you know, my brain's just going, going a mile a minute right now. Well, let's talk more about his love of music. We'll come back to the film stuff. You know, I'm trying to remember some of the ones he said, um, and I know that he worked in music before he worked in film. He was always so humble about it that when he would just kind of let a little thing come out and you'd be like, what? <laughs> He was really humble about it. I, you know, I, I can't remember anything right off the bat, but I'm sure Dan or Guy could. At one point, we tried to get a project going together with a really close friend of his named Bob Kulik, who's a, kind of a legendary rock and roll guitar player, recorded with Kiss. I don't think he ever toured with him, but his brother joined Kiss for a stint, Bruce. And uh, so Bob had a studio in Van Nuys, kind of near the airport. We'd go there and talk about pitching this project, about maybe shooting like a 3D, because Bob's... Uh, wheelhouse was he would take get these legendary heavy metal guys and alice cooper and all these ma amazing legends d Hyder from twisted sister you know this story <laughs> <laughs> i know this story <laughs> bob's wheelhouse was he would get these guys together they would re-record either like a christmas album and it always had some kind of creepy heavy metal over yeah I, I grew up as a rock and roll heavy metal fan and d snyder from twisted sister had a um an album that he did of all of all class like Broadway show tunes. And I think maybe there was some overlap with Alice Cooper, um, but they did like, you know, uh, these great, like Sweeney Todd, uh, the, the, the main theme, and Alice Cooper would sing it. Anyway, we tried to make, do these music videos and maybe shoot them in 3D and make them a movie and put them in a movie theater. So I had many mo uh, meetings with Bob. And, um, it was fun watching those two talk music because I think they all, they knew each other way back in, you know, when they got started in New Jersey. I'm not positive, but, uh, it was it was always fun to, to to hang with those guys, and I think at some point Bob moved to Las Vegas, and so and you know we never got the project up and off the ground. But we you know pitched it around, and got some interest, but you know nobody came forth with a checkbook. So that's the way it happens. Yeah, I remember him telling me that story because I, I want to say that it was D. Snyder was going to sing "My Way." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and he was oh I, yeah he was excited about that. I mean, he was like, you know, he was like, I can't wait, you know, he called me, on, it was on a Sunday, and he called me, he said, we're going to do this thing, it's so cool, and he was so excited about that, but yeah, there was something that fell through on, on that, that, but it sounded very cool. Yeah, yeah, D, D was going to do all Sinatra, and he did, I mean, I think the Broadway show tunes was a variety of people, and I think Alice Cooper, his manager, wouldn't let him release it, I mean, there was all kinds of red tape, and it just wasn't worth us trying, I mean, then to try and get everybody wrangled together, if any. Do it, Larry could, but it was it was still I think it too much because you just deal with the, the artists and the managers, and it was it was wasn't worth all the hassle we would have had to go through. That's too bad. Sounds like it would have been amazing. Yeah. Larry <laughs> talked uh, quite a bit about a project he did last year. It was a Quibi show called I think Royalties that Amy yeah. Heckerling directed, and as I understand it, you know the Quibbies are sort of divided into ten minute segments, and each of those segments I think had a musical performance as a part of the segment as well as a narrative performance and after he finished uh, when we would gather at Republic of Pi, he would talk about you know some of the things that uh, that happened on that. I know he had a a, a musical artist i I don't know the name, but uh, somebody who canceled literally the, the Sunday night before they were supposed to shoot on Monday and they had to uh, kind of make a, a, a scramble as ADs do when, when things fall out and you can't shoot what you had planned. And he said it actually worked in their favor. They, they had to go, I think, an extra day on the project, but they ended up in a better location to shoot uh, what they had to do for that musical number. And they, I think, the person that they got to replace the musician who backed out was was a better choice. So. <laughs> Happens with us. Yeah, he was talking about him and John Stamos are you know both drummers and the drums and the Beach Boys. So he really, he really had a great time on that episode in particular. I know. I remember he talked about a uh, there was a song about the size of King Kong's uh, genitals, <laughs> and I think Mark Hamill was was oh, uh, involved in that segment. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. Now, I know Larry did quite a bit of location work, but um, one of you suggested that uh, he was going to try to stick to L.A. going forward. No, I mean, I remember, you know, it, it caused a big uh, up on, uh, on the social media platforms because he, he kind of implied that he was retiring. But he really said, and it's clear that uh, I really don't want to do much more location work because he did a spin in Chicago and Atlanta. 
Um, and just wanted to stay home. I mean, I think he had just hit his 70th birthday and he was like, just want to be home with, you know, with, with Lynn and Lee and, uh, and, uh, I'm available and able and ready to, you know, I'll be there tomorrow morning at 7am if you need me, but I, I want to be all the way. And, uh, I thought that was pretty cool that, that you know, he did that. And, but of course he sp had to spend days explaining, no, 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 let me be clear. <laughs> it's just, <a> <laughs> he's, he's retiring from L from Atlanta not retiring from the business and not retiring from, from the, from LA. Just, he just didn't want to be here anymore. Yeah, that yeah. was the last show. That was the last show that he did here. And yeah, because he died in Chicago. Yeah, my wife grew up in Chicago and 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 uh, has a ton of friends and, and and relatives still in the business. And the day the day Larry passed, she got a call. And but um, they were asking if because I mean he got his time in Chicago. He got kind of known as as you know it's a small community, just like any small town, any any town that has a small film community. And they asked me if I knew Larry, and you know. Um, so he left a little impression from his time on the shy. Didn't Lynn and Lee also, uh, when they when he worked in Atlanta, I think it was a really long time. She and and the dog went with them. I, uh, I think at one point a couple of years ago, I remember that they all like she like Lynn and Lee took, went with him. Um, I can't remember what project it was. Yeah, I want to take a moment there. You you guys both mentioned Lee and for folks who haven't put it together, Lee was uh, Larry and Lynn's pit bull who, as I understand, passed not that long ago as well. But Larry did have a, a real love for animals, as I understand it. Uh, Pitbulls in particular. Yeah. Played on his car was, like, I think, Pitbull. So Pitbull, Pitbull. won. Pitbull won. <laughs> Pitbull won. There you go. They, um, they got Lee as a rescue from um, a Pitbull rescue organization. Um, and he was really involved in it. Um, if, you know, I'm sure all of us are friends on his Facebook page. He was always trying to help other pit bulls get rescued and find homes. And uh, yeah, that he, he didn't just get the dog and then walk away. I mean, they stayed friends. In fact, um, the organization uh, started a GoFundMe page for, for his uh, funeral expenses for Lynn. So it, it was definitely a big part of him. Let's talk more about um, Larry's service to the industry overall. Uh, Bruce, you guys were on some committees together and also at the Television Academy. Yeah, Larry was uh, particularly interested in all of the new technology, visual effects, digital technology, all those things. And uh, as, as part of the committee, uh, he would uh, come to Republic of Pi or guild meetings and stuff and share, you know, things that they had been given a preview of or, or demo of. And he would always tell us about things that were coming up for the DGA Digital Day and uh, events like that where all the new technology was going to be sort of demonstrated and, and you could ask questions and so forth. And, and he was right there sort of getting the first look at it and, and sharing uh, what he saw with, uh, with the rest of us, which was great. I remember there was, there was a thing, um, uh, it's, a, it's a game engine system that provides uh, virtual backgrounds that he saw demonstrated that was really quite impressive. I think they used it on The Mandalorian and, and some of the other uh, projects of that scale. And he just, uh, while it's still a relatively expensive uh, option for people, it was amazing what he talked about as far as the, the realism of the, the backgrounds that could be created for filming in front of and the speed at which you could literally switch to the reverse angle or change the environment altogether by using this technology. And he was, he was very impressed with that. I think talking about his service to the Guild and his um, passing on of, of new knowledge, Quite a few folks have spoken to him in the role of mentor, both uh, uh, Dan and Pamela, you both uh, mentioned that. And then Bruce, you mentioned him being part of this group at the Republic of Pi. Tell me more about um, what he did as far as mentoring other assistant directors. He was just such an open guy and very easy to talk to, very, very friendly. Um, very thoughtful. He would give you, you know, he would listen to what people said and then, and you could tell that he was thinking about it. He wasn't trying to interject his own uh, ideas until they finished. 
and then he would give you a really thoughtful perspective on it and and a lot of good advice. Uh, some of the people that would come to our coffee gathering, most of the people I would say were younger ADs in an earlier phase of their career. And uh, there were just countless times where, you know, Larry would share an experience he had or a piece of advice that was helpful to those people. I, I remember, I just, I just remember, you know, he, he, like I said before, when did top dog, how he was, he would always, you know, and we did a, a, you know, it was Top Dog, and, and we did this this TV movie together with work with kids and stuff like that. And I remember him always telling me, it's like, you know, I'm going to teach you. You be sure to pass it along. You know, and 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 that's I've done that for years now. It's a, you know, I remembered that that, that you know he, I have he put a lot of knowledge into my head, and it's my job is to pass that knowledge along to other to other kids as they're coming up the ranks. And, and I more I find myself pulling more information that was given to me by him than anybody else that I pass along. I mean, he 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 knew what he was doing. He knew his stuff. He knew his job. He knew he knew the job of an assistant director, and 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 he loved doing it. And it, you know you could tell by watching watching him work and the way that he talked to people and the way that he he related to people it was just it was just it was, it was kind of cool to watch because you know, because you know you 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 knew that he was gonna you know that when he get to a group of people together it's like what's larry talking about let's go let's go listen to what larry's talking about you know because he you know number one there was going to be a story in there but also yeah. you know the information that you, that you were going to get out of it it was fantastic and you would remember it that, that's an important part, part day because we're in a business i mean where there's egos and everybody's afraid of the next generation taking their their spot or you know you know the, it, it's an and it's a you know the director's guild is a relatively small group of people you know to con compare to you know other groups that exist right so he knew the importance of kind of uh sharing knowledge and not keeping it to yourself and he wasn't uh threatened he didn't hear footsteps as they say and uh that's a rare commodity and uh, definitely something to be and you know again coupled with Great people skills. He could talk to anybody about and, and be a common force. And he was, you know, again, a filmmaker who was interested in technology for the future as well. It's a, it's kind of a, the, the, the best possible pack for, um, for somebody in this business. And he, he had it all. Larry <laughs> would always uh, demonstrate uh, some of the new apps that you could have for your phone or your tablet uh, that were production related apps that you could use on the set, whether it was something you know you would take on a location scout to like do a quick floor plan or map out an area to you know weather predicting to you know any number of other apps and he would always be on uh, the panel as one of the demonstrators of these apps when we had our digital day events he was a he was a gizmo i mean he, he liked technology i mean he that's that was that was his thing was technology he enjoyed it and and, and he always wanted to be you know, he couldn't, you couldn't throw enough at him because he would just, just, just like a sponge. You know what I mean, he just takes it in and just keeps taking it, taking it in, taking it in. And never stop, you know, and, and, you know, I mean, uh, I was talking to Lynn yesterday and she's like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Because he has all this equipment in the house um, of, you know, recording equipment and sound equipment, all kinds of stuff. And it's because, you know, he, he wanted to, to absorb that stuff. He wanted, you know, he wanted, it was a, it was a toy for him. It was something to play with, and he enjoyed it. Yeah, he was. Uh, I remember the couple, few times I was over his house. He loved to show me his turntable, yeah. which it turned yeah, yeah, technology. But he had like the mm -hmm. turntable. Might have been a Macintosh, but not like Mac, like Apple Macintosh, like MC. He had the, he had the shit, the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He did, he didn't he didn't waste his money on on just buying anything. I I know the turntable you're talking about. You know, and and it's because he he believes like no, you know. CDs block, you know, it is, it's all, it's, it's all records. It has to be albums. Cause that's where you get your best sound out of. Yeah. But it was, that, I remember that turntable. I think it was expensive <laughs> and the speakers he had in the room, those huge, this was at his house. He had these huge wall speakers and they're just, <laughs> these things are giants. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had a, a Netflix shoot at his house uh, sometime in the past year. And I think part of that was some new technology they were trying out. It wasn't an actual, 
uh, full project, but it was uh, a couple of nights that were shooting in his backyard, I think, uh, testing out some new technology. And they were very impressed with his uh, equipment when they scouted the house. Well, when you were talking about mentoring, I, I just um, I just remember that he was, um, you know, it's he was quiet, right? He was never loud or he was never boastful. He was so humble. And I think he was much more productive because he was quiet and because when he had something to say, it, it really made sense and it was valid and everyone listened. It was like he could call you over with his calm, quiet voice. And, uh, and that really stuck out to me. It was always um, just seeing him, you know, at an, at an event or anything like that, the, that beaming smile, the nice soothing tone. It never kind of wavered whether you were at work or at play. So everyone just was quiet and listened. Yeah. It set a tone. Yeah. I think Larry and I bonded over just a passion for being assistant directors. We, we, we loved the job. We loved the details and the, the interaction with the various crew members and departments and, and figuring out the, the puzzle that would become the schedule and all those things. And uh, that kept bringing us back together again and again. And then we started to share more about things like him not wanting to go out of town. I think I came to that uh, point earlier in my career than, than he did, but I completely uh, encouraged him to, uh, to take that stand. And uh, we also got to talking about how, you know, ageism, uh, although, you know, it's, it's not a specific prejudice, it definitely has uh, affected our job opportunities in, in recent years. And, and we were talking in some detail about that as well. Yeah, we, we were emailing back and forth um, just, gosh, about a month ago because I, um, I, I jumped from second AD to UPM, uh, which was always my goal. Um, so Larry was really good about being my mentor one moment and still being humble enough, which um, I have to tell you, I've had people that I've worked for and they were first ADs. Um, and then when I became a UPM to hire them because I really, you know, enjoyed working with them and it didn't work out so well because they couldn't see me. The second AD is all of a sudden their boss, the UPM. Larry was never like that. And we were trying to find, you know, he, I think was free, just got free. And so did I. And he's like, well, you know, he sent me an email and said, how about, you know, the next gig, let's try it. You know, and I was like, you know, your lips to God's ear. Um, <laughs> uh, as usual, when you're freelancing, you know, I, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, and you try and find a gig and try and get the people that you want to work with at the same time that never worked out. And, and I'm just so, you know, so bummed that it didn't. What is clear to me that uh, Larry passed on a lot of knowledge to all of you made quite an impression and Dan, to the point you were making earlier, as far as the part of his legacy is that knowledge going further that uh, all of you folks pass in on as well. Yeah, I, I also want to say one thing, and I'm sure that every all, all of us know this. Seeing the way he was devoted to Lynn. I've been single for quite a long time now. <laughs> um, and so sometimes you kind of just uh, don't really... Um, have the hope that there is true love really there does it really exist you know and then you see the way he loved lynn and devoted himself to her and, and the way she was with him you know she worked on on the show too and i didn't know her as well because she was kind of um i'd say more introverted but just when you saw them together it totally means it made sense and he was he really loved her and i, I just to see someone really be so loving towards their spouse uh, gives gives one hope. <laughs> when we were doing Top Dog in San Diego, um, he came up to me and he said he was going to propose to Lynn. She was doing she was doing background work that day, and he wanted me to take a picture of them when he gave her the ring. I said, "Yeah, sure, no problem." 
And what he had done was that Lynn had, at the time, Lynn had always wanted a Corvette. So he went out and he bought a little, you know, model Corvette. And he gave it to her at, uh, at lunchtime in front of her. The entire crew is there. As we all know what's going to happen. <laughs> so, he gives, so he gives her this Corvette. Now, it wasn't on and, the call sheet, was it? it wasn't no, it wasn't on, on the call sheet. It wasn't on the call sheet. No, no. <laughs> okay. And, and uh, uh, he gives her the Corvette, and she's looking at it and everything like that. And she's like, oh, it's a girl. And, and the doors open up. And, and a little, little trunk, a little, little pop of the hood. Just look at the hood. And there was the ring sitting there in the hood compartment. She just froze literally froze and then she started crying and i took the picture of him and that picture for years sat on their mantle at home the reason why i'm saying that was because i was so moved by it it was such a like such a a thing because you knew that you knew that this is a guy who really truly loved his wife that i cut their heads off his face. <laughs> <laughs> And pol- unfortunately, it's Polaroid. So, you know, it's, it's it. You know, when you wait, you know, when you get to wave it, you know, it's the ones that we were taking back in those days. So we didn't have, you know, cell phone. And, and so I was like, oh, God, oh, God, you know, and, and, but it was, it was, he truly loved his wife. Lynn, it, you know, yeah, I talked to her yesterday and, 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 and she misses him because she, he was such a driving force in her life too. They they were they were they were yin and yang. They were supposed to be together. It was always you know he he was always like, at this show. Lynn's coming at this show. Lynn's coming. Yeah, it, 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 I'm agreeing with you, Pamela. It was it, they they truly did. They belong together. They really really. Did. Yeah, that was really obvious. Yeah. Larry and Lynn had planned uh, some sort of an anniversary trip uh, this year where they were going to fly, I think, to Rome and then board a cruise ship and and visit various ports in and around Europe. And one of the last times I saw him, he was still talking about this was as the coronavirus was starting to spread, but before it had been declared a pandemic and so forth. But he was trying to figure out whether he should cancel based on the number of cases in Italy or keep the trip plan going. And he had up to a certain date before he would lose a deposit or something like that. And that was one of the last the uh, things we chatted about. Wow. Uh, yeah, I came across a uh, voicemail on my phone a couple of days ago and played it back, and it was tough. It was really tough. Just checking in. He was just checking in with me and what's going on, and I'll try your other number, and that's it. Uh, and I'm sure I, I, you know, I think we talked, and it was no, you know, no big deal, just a, a basic check in. But uh, yeah, it was tough to hear that voice. This Sunday was. This Sunday was was a, a tough one for me because this was the first this this is the first sunday and i don't even want to even think about how long that we didn't talk wow. and 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 i knew it um so we did a, my wife and i did a little toast to, to larry yeah that's well, amazing though that even tells about his uh, how he values his friendships and stuff that you guys you know would do that every sunday that's amazing yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we, I mean, we like I said, we just talk about whatever. We talk about the business. We talk about you know what's going on in each other's lives, whatever it was. We, we you know, it was you know, fifteen twenty minutes, but it was you know, you know, I always knew it was it was because you know, my wife just teased me about it. you know that the 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 phone would ring on Sunday. She goes, "Larry's calling." You didn't have to look at it. it. Was it was he called four o'clock every Sunday? You always knew what time you could set your watch to four o'clock. Larry's calling. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, and we, and, and like, I, 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 like I said, this Sunday was a tough one because it was the first one. I, I, somebody, I got some uh, an email that's today, and I don't remember what it was. An email about information or something. And yeah, um, and my first thought that I went to was I need to call Larry and tell Larry about this. Yeah, hmm. it's like, phone. Well. well, I think that we were all really blessed to know him. Um, I'm a little envious, Dan, that you got to know him <laughs> longer and closer. <laughs> you got well, to work with him more. But I feel like no matter what, I think anyone that um, anyone that was observant or around um, Larry, I mean, if you were open, he would he would touch you in some way. And I'm I'm really grateful for that. 
I, I think that's really true. Um, the this Republic of Pi group that uh, has now become a virtual meeting with uh, many more people than we could ever fit in the coffee shop, <laughs> uh, up, up, upwards of 40 and 50 people a week. Last uh, Tuesday, what was 55? <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we were all, you know, aware. Uh, it, I think everybody had met Larry or had worked with him and we were all aware that he was in the hospital and uh, it was devastating and universal among the group when we all heard that that he had passed. It made this whole terrible pandemic, you know, seem very much more real and close to home and urgent. And we were all just, I think, still processing the, the shock of not having Larry anymore. Yeah. I had gotten a uh, text the morning after uh, from my friend Jim Goldthwaite, who's a, another, you know, first AD friend of mine and friend of ours. And he knew that Larry and I were close, and, and I had no idea he was in the hospital or any, any of that. So that was about as big a gut punch as I've ever gotten when I, when I woke up and saw that text. And, uh, yeah, that, that one hurt, man. That one really is going to stick with me for a while. Yeah, I, I got a text from Lynn that morning, and, and it was just, you know, I, just did, I sent her a text that said, how you doing? And, and her response was, you know, Larry didn't make it. So, and then I said, Larry didn't make it. I don't want to talk to anybody. And I'm like, okay. And so, you know, I, I started calling everybody that I knew, you know, him and I shared, shared, shared uh, relationships with, started calling people and saying, hey, just so you know, this happened. Because I didn't want people that I knew to find it on, you know, find out about it on Facebook. You know, it, it was all, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. I'm like, no, it's not. You know, and, and the, the, the listen to, to um, how many broken hearts. I mean, I sent a text to an AD friend of mine uh, who lives in Wisconsin. His name's Tim Lonsdale. And I don't know if you guys know Tim. Tim is an army, was a, an army ranger. He's, he's about as hard of a guy as you could possibly meet. And I sent him a text and he sent me one back saying, you just broke my heart. I, I didn't find out until uh, Thursday, last Thursday, um, a week ago before um, that he was in the hospital. Um, and we were... Um, some of the council members we had a zoom meeting um that we um needed to get some council business done for the dga and <laughs> council and um that's when we found out so i called lynn that night and that's when she told me like what i had relayed to you earlier and um so i i kind of sent an email through them and i included a couple other people like bruce that i knew knew um, knew him and just said, Hey, I'm going to, we're trying to, I'm going to send some soup over there and we're, I'm going to do some grocery shopping if you want to pitch in and everyone pitched in. Um, and I went grocery shopping, dropped it off at her house. Uh, you know, we talked over the phone. She, she texted, you know, thank you. And then she texted me, Larry's doing better. And so I relayed that to the group that was, you know, um, that contributed and, everybody started oh that's great that's wonderful you know everybody responded to that um and then you know um on the morning of the first i got the same text that dan got like larry didn't make it yeah. i don't want to talk to anybody i relayed that to the group and it was just you know we were all thinking you know i mean it just wasn't even fathomable that he would pass and like we okay he's better he'll be out of the hospital soon we'll be able to you know then another care package. So when it happened, it just was like, it was really unexpected. You like really on it unexpected. You know, he, he, we've, we've all shared very, you know, how much you meant to us. Um, I'm going to end this thing on a, on a laugh on a funny, funny thing, because this is, because he made us all laugh at different times. And um, so Tim Lonsdale, Jay Tobias, myself, well, me and Tim, we used to play golf every weekend or every other weekend. We we go out. There was a uh, out by Manhattan Beach Studios. There's there's a hotel that has a golf course. It's a par three golf course. Tim and I play there all the time. And Larry and Jay wanted to go out one weekend. And 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 I'm like, okay, fine. And, and I asked Larry. I said, you could play golf. He goes, yeah, I can play golf. Like, all right. So we got out there, and Tim and I decided to take bets as to who was going to lose more balls. 
Jay Tobias, or if it was going to be Larry. Larry lost more balls. And I went up to after, <laughs> afterwards and I said, Larry, come on, dude, you know, you, you said you play golf. How can you lose as many golf? He's like, I don't know. I play really well on the Wii at home. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. That's, that's, that's Larry. Yeah. That's Larry. And I, I laughed my ass off. And, and, and that is, that's Larry to me. You know, that was Larry. You know, we, we've laughed, we've cried, we've, we've been angry at the world together, uh, but, but the man could make you laugh. You know, and, 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 and he always put a smile on your face and, and he, always, um, he always had something good to say. You know, there, there, was, there, was, there was more positive in his world than there was negative because he just didn't like to have negative. And that's my funny story. Appreciate you guys coming today and, and sharing these stories. Larry is missed. That's good. Thank you. Listeners, I welcome your feedback. You can send your email comments to skid, S-K-I-D, at below the line, one word, dot biz. That's B-I-Z. If you're an iTunes user, please rate us. It helps us reach new listeners. And if you're on Facebook, you can find photos and other behind-the-scenes materials at the podcast below the line. Finally, you can follow the podcast on Twitter and Instagram. It's at pod below the line. Thanks to Curtis Five for our music and John Wan for our logo. The logo is available on t-shirts, mugs, and stickers at redbubble.com. We'll be back next week with another episode, most likely picking up again with our series about the property. Until then, be safe. Huh?